22 years ago this week, on the August 9th, 1999 episode of Raw is War, Chris Jericho made his WWE debut in what is, to this day, one of the greatest debuts of all time. I have it on my list as the second greatest debut in WWE history, behind only Kane in 1997. I mean... Let's be honest here. I mean, Jericho, as cool as this all was, Jericho came out and he talked. Kane came out and he kicked ass and he ripped the door off its hinges and he laid out The Undertaker. I mean, come on. But that's not to take away from Jericho's first appearance. It was a little over a month earlier the WWE announced Jericho's signing on its website, something they did, according to Bruce Pritchard, to try to scoop the dirt sheets. Since they're going to announce it anyway, we'll announce it ourselves on our website. We'll go ahead and spoil the fact that Jericho is coming in. We'll just spoil it ourselves. He was unhappy with his position, Jericho was, in WCW, and he he did back, he admits, he backed out of a verbal commitment that he had made months earlier to Eric Bischoff, which Bischoff was not happy about. But as Jericho says, they took forever after they reached that verbal deal you know, Bischoff and WCW took forever to send him an actual contract to sign. He would ask about it, and it took months, I think. And in that time, he ended up having a secret meeting in Stanford at Vince McMahon, or not even Stanford, in, uh, I guess, Greenwich it would have been, at Vince McMahon's house. It wasn't even at the office. It was at Vince McMahon's house, at the McMansion. At a secret meeting with Vince and some of the other WWE executives. And that was when he made the decision that he was going to make a break for it and leave WCW and try his hand in WWE. And for weeks on television, they aired these Millennium Countdown vignettes for someone or something counting down to Raw in Chicago on August 9th. And during his appearance on the Broken Skull Sessions with Steve Austin, Jericho explained how he came up with the countdown idea in the first place. He said, I remember standing in line at the post office and there was a clock that said countdown to the millennium. And I remember thinking that would be a great way for somebody to come into the WWE. It would be a great way for me to come into the WWE. And that's when I said, I will be the millennium man. The countdown to the new millennium, that's me. And the millennium man is going to be a change, get rid of all the old and bring in the new. One of my opening promos was everybody in WWE was boring and I was the most entertaining guy and all this other stuff. And it came from the post office. I called Vince Russo and I told him this idea and he thought it was great. He called Vince McMahon and here's the genius of it. We calibrated it so the countdown would end at the beginning of Raw. And I would open the show. But Vince said, no, you're going to come out in the middle of the show and interrupt a promo by The Rock which to me is the genius of all geniuses. And that's what he did. He got a huge reaction as soon as the name Jericho appeared on the Titan Tron. People knew who he was. He cut a promo on how he was here to save the WWF, and he got to verbally joust with The Rock on his very first night in the company. It was great. The show was memorable for other reasons, too. Jesse Ventura, then the governor of Minnesota, made an appearance ahead of his refereeing gig at SummerSlam. Kane, actually, I think he did some commentary that night, too. Kane and X-Pac beat the Acolytes to win the tag team titles, and after the match, X-Pac took away Kane's voice box device that he would use to speak, and he forced Kane to speak his first words without it, which were, Suck it! Actually, I, well, I mean, to do it the way he did, it was like, suck it. That's a little bit closer to what he actually said. But the place popped huge for Kane telling everybody to suck it. Whatever it is. How uh, very inspirational. And China pinned Triple H in the main event. A Falls Count Anywhere triple threat number one contenders match that also included The Undertaker to become the number one contender for the WWF title at SummerSlam. She would end up being the number one contender for all of one week. 21 years ago this week, on August 13th, 2000, WCW hosted its New Blood Rising pay-per-view from Vancouver, 
a mess of a show that featured Buff Bagwell against Chris Canyon in a Judy Bagwell on a pole match, bro. Judy Bagwell being Buff's mom. She was actually uh, not on a pole, but she was tied to a forklift and raised up while the forklift sat in the aisleway. Former WCW World Heavyweight Champion himself, David Arquette, who was in Vancouver filming a movie at the time, he made a surprise appearance during the match, attacking Bagwell, who made a comeback on both men, and won, and then rescued his mom. The match itself wasn't really all that bad, but the uh, the stipulation was, uh, it was something else. Then came the triple threat match with Kevin Nash, Scott Steiner, and Bill Goldberg. And I mean this when I say this. This right here, to me, was the single worst thing that Vince Russo ever did. I know that's saying a lot. But this was the worst thing he ever did in WCW. This is the one thing that he did that just grinded my gears more than anything else. And it's one of the reasons he gets a lot of flack, and I think deservedly so. After the whole work shoot deal the month before, at Bash at the Beach with Russo and Hogan, which turned into a real shoot, Russo went wild with the announcers dropping insider terminology on TV and just trying to replicate what he had done on that show. In this case, that included Goldberg, quote, going against the script and walking out in the middle of the match. So midway through the show, Tony Schiavone gets word that Goldberg has been in a motorcycle accident. He may not be able to make the show. Kevin Nash is skeptical, right, in storyline. Now, mind you, Russo had just turned Goldberg heel in June. Goldberg. Bill Goldberg. The hottest babyface this company ever created, who was still over, and who the people still wanted to cheer, and he turned him heel. So before the match, Tony Schiavone talks about who they think is going to go over during this match. Scott Hudson said that he thinks Kevin Nash has the political stroke to take the victory. Mark Madden, who is fucking terrible on these shows, picks Scott Steiner. Because if they want things to, quote, go down a certain way, and he doesn't want them to go down that way, then they're not going to go down that way. There's no discussion in any of this about the match itself as any kind of actual athletic competition. Only inside references to all this backstage bullshit. Goldberg did show up for the match. He showed up late. And when Nash goes to give him a jackknife powerbomb, Goldberg just shoves him away, and he walks out. And Nash looks stunned. Russo confronts Goldberg in the aisle and tells him to get his ass back in the ring. Goldberg says, fuck you, and he walks to the back. And the match continues with Nash and Steiner. And the commentary gets even more insufferable, with Madden wondering if maybe Goldberg was supposed to do something... Scott Hudson says he believes that Goldberg was supposed to go up for the jackknife and instead he swerved Kevin Nash. <laughs> it's like, Tony Schiavone wonders if the jackknife was part of the plan and what are they going to do now? Improvise? This was actual commentary during this pay-per-view match. Nash went on to win the match. He became the number one contender for the WCW title. This led to an equally embarrassing, actually, this was, I think this was even worse, an embarrassing TV commercial promoting their fall brawl pay-per-view around the fact that Goldberg, and I quote, refused to follow the script, and now he would be wrestling Scott Steiner with no script. This was Russo at his dog shit worst. And you know, it's one thing to try to recreate your own Montreal screw job, as if we haven't seen that before. But you don't beat people over the head like they did here with the fact that this is all fake. It was bad enough I had to listen to Vince McMahon on TV with Jim Ross talk about how Bret Hart didn't do the time honored tradition. 
the worst thing that Russo has ever done right here. This gets my vote. 20 years ago this week, on the August 13th, 2001 episode of Raw is War, from the Allstate Arena in Chicago, a dark day in wrestling as Stone Cold Steve Austin gives birth to the What Chant. During the opening segment of the show, he came out with the Alliance. This was during the invasion period, heading into SummerSlam. See, he's alone in the ring. He's addressing all of the troops, all of the Alliance members who were circled outside the ring. And Austin was looking for someone to take out Kurt Angle tonight. But first, he's got to browbeat some people. And he calls Taz, Hugh Morris, and Raven into the ring. Austin doesn't like that Chris Jericho beat Hugh Morris' ass last week. He goes, your name is Hugh Morris. What? Is that funny? Is that humorous? He did the same thing with Raven. He did the same thing with Taz. Insulted them. And in the weeks that followed, he just kept doing it. With the what stuff. He would just randomly insert the what stuff in the middle of, of every single promo he did. Sold a lot of t-shirts. It was kind of fun at the beginning. But here we are 20 years later, and the fans still chant this. The single worst contribution Austin ever made to the wrestling business is that dumb what chant. And it all started with a rambling voicemail that he left for Christian while he was on the road. Christian said he wishes he had kept the message. Obviously, he, he deleted it a long time ago. But he was checking his messages, and there was one from Steve Austin who said, I'm just passing a tree. What? I said, I'm passing a tree. What? And when he got to the arena, Christian asked him, what the hell is up with that voicemail that you left me? And Austin said, I don't know. I was just bored and I was rambling. <laughs> now, you know what? That does sound funny. 20 years ago. But not today. It's one of the few things I actually miss about the Thunderdome. No what chance. In an interview years ago with Sam Roberts, Austin said, Everybody always says, what ruins everybody else's promos? It does not. If you leave that gap in between your sentences, your words, your phrasing, don't interrupt your cadence and give them that end for the what chant. If you just keep talking like what I'm doing, I don't give you a chance to say it. That is true. But what he fails to realize is that not everybody is supposed to speed through their promos like a freight train. I mean, this is Steve Austin here, one of the greatest of all time. He knows that. He doesn't need me, Joe Blow, to tell him that. Right? Every promo is different. Not everybody is out there when they're cutting a promo supposed to be speeding through it. You're supposed to take a breath every now and then. Although if they did speed through their promos like a freight train, how would WWE ever fill three hours of television every Monday night? That's why Paul Heyman talks to us like we're a child. <laughs> he enunciates every single word, every syllable of every word. 17 years ago this week, on August 15th, 2004, at SummerSlam in Toronto, Randy Orton became the youngest World Heavyweight Champion in history at just 24 years of age, with a win over Chris Benoit. The next night on Raw, Orton was excommunicated from Evolution by a vengeful and jealous Triple H, who took the title from him only a month later, which did not do Orton any favors. The idea was that they would build him up as the babyface challenger to Triple H's title at WrestleMania the following year, but a funny thing happened. Batista got over as a bigger babyface than Randy Orton, and he ended up getting the spot instead and winning the championship at WrestleMania 21. Unlike Orton, Batista was quite a bit older when he won his first world title. Orton was 24, Batista was 36. 14 years ago this week, on August 12, 2007, Adam Pacman Jones made his debut appearance for TNA Wrestling on the company's Hard Justice pay-per-view from the Impact Zone in Orlando. Jones played in the NFL at the time for the Tennessee Titans, and he was a very controversial figure, having been suspended without pay for the entire 2007 season into the beginning of the 2008 season for conduct detrimental to the NFL. 
He had been arrested six times since being drafted by the Titans. So Jimmy Uso has some uh, catching up to do. Although Pac-Man's charges did not include DUI, but it included stuff like assault and felony vandalism, drug possession, disorderly conduct and public intoxication. The most publicized incident, the worst of all these incidents, was a shooting that took place earlier that same year in Las Vegas at a strip club after he made it rain. With hundreds of $1 bills, the club owner told one of his dancers to pick up all the bills. And Jones grabbed the woman by the hair and slammed her head on the stage, which led to a brawl between his entourage and a security guard who ended up being shot. Allegedly by a bullet fired by one of Jones's men. There was another person who got shot who was paralyzed from the waist down. So naturally, only a few months later, TNA decided to bring him on in. Only the Titans didn't want him doing anything physical, and they filed a restraining order preventing him from doing so. They didn't want him to get hurt. So, here on this show, he debuted for an in-ring interview with Mike Tenay. He had what, what at best I could call negative charisma. Ron Killings interrupted. He wanted to fight him. Security held him back. Later on in the pay-per-view, we learned that somebody had bloodied up Pac-Man Jones and left him for dead. By the time he made his uh, Impact debut, he and Ron Killings, they had made amends. I guess he's a very forgiving man, Pac-Man is, having been left for dead on this show. And from there, the two of them would form Team Pac-Man. And not only do they end up challenging for the TNA Tag Team titles at the next pay-per-view, they win them! From Kurt Angle and Sting! With Pac-Man Jones not being able to do a single thing because he is not allowed to. But when Kurt Angle turns on Sting, Ron Killings allows Pac-Man to get the pin. He pinned Sting. And it only got worse from there. The entire Pac-Man saga, from beginning to end, was the very definition of WrestleCrap.